I'm, I'm going to, this gentleman on my right hand side here is, has a career that is, is, is too um, impressive for me to remember. I have to read it out because it says more than I can remember, uh, so please forgive me. <laughs> well, it's but, just minimum compared to the whole this. We're not into competition at the moment, I mean. Uh, Pierre Lacanté is, is um, without doubt an international, one of the most well-known international experts in the field of urban and urban transportation planning and linking the two together. Um, and, and more, more well, actually more recently, it's not recent, it's um, linking environmental issues uh, with, with these, these areas of concern. Interestingly, he has a doctorate in laws, and don't hold it against him, as, uh, and in economics. Um, and uh, this is from the Louvain, and now how do I pronounce this, Louvain University, correct? Um, and uh, also, uh, th this is an honorary doctorate from the Edmund Napier University, um, as I read here. Um, he was one of the three planners in charge of the Louvain University group. Um, this team uh, was entrusted in 1969 with the planning and architectural coordination of the new university town of uh, Louvain uh, Le Neuve to be built along the model of the historic town of Louvain. The land, uh, about a hundred, uh, sorry, a thousand hectares, initially agricultural, and this is the topic that uh, Pierre will present today, I understand, um, is entirely owned by the university, if only that was true here, and developed through long-term leases. It is today a major growth pole south of Brussels. We all know where Brussels is, capital of Europe, remember? Okay. Uh, it, inclu it includes, uh, since 1976, an underground railway station and has numerous ecological features such as separation of stormwater and sewage water and heating by natural gas. Its center is entirely a pedestrian, um, and uh, Lacant is former vice chair of the European Environmental Agency Scientific Committee, honorary secretary general of the International Association of Public Transport, the UITP, which is where I first met him, and past president of the International Society of City Regional Planners, and president of the foundation of the urban environment. Um, and there are details. Uh, on his website, which I'm sure he'll be prepared to give you, or we can give you. I think you'll get some idea just from that brief introduction, not too brief really, um, about Pierre. Um, thank you, Pierre, for coming uh, here, linked to the continent, CTRL, one of the mega projects um, of the UK. Um, what I'd like to do, Pierre, if I may, um, is just to briefly ask everyone in this room to just very quickly give them name, where they're from, which course, which country they're from. It's a great pleasure. So you can then get some idea of the audience. Yes, okay. Absolutely. Um, this gentleman needs no introduction, so without being <laughs> rude. <laughs> <we're like laughs> <laughs> May I add one point? Right. One area where I'm particularly proud of is that you may probably not remember it, but you made a chapter in my, among my very first books, which I was published in Philadelphia. Uh, changing cities challenge to plan, which already was treating the same things, but it was the solar pool about the influence of telephones and so on, and uh, there you are. Hello everybody, my name is Robin Sterrett and I work at Central Government. Um, I was born in Brighton, but I lived in London. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Wei, I'm, I'm from China, and I'm a master in urban studies. Hi, I'm Chloe, I'm from France, and I'm also in the uh, urban studies. Hi, I'm Will, uh, I'm from China, I'm uh, my bachelor's, uh, which is China for Harry. I'm Carlos, I'm from Colombia, I'm doing the master of main infrastructure. I'm Michael, I'm from Greece, and I'm also a MIPA student. I'm Yuki, I'm MIPA student, um, I'm from China. I'm Leila from MIPA and from China as well. I'm Chris from China, some students from MIPA students. I'm Marco Dean, I'm from Italy, I'm a research assistant of the Omega Center. Hi, um, my name is Pavel, I'm from Poland, and I do master um, in urban regeneration here in Poland. 
I'm James, I'm from Birmingham, I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Cambridge. I'm Hina, I'm from Japan, I'm a student at the University of Cambridge. Phil Wright, uh, Birmingham Centre. Uh, my name is Keen, and I'm from Ireland, and I'm studying at the uh, MSc Program in International Planning here at UCL. My name is Ian, I'm from Ireland as well, and I'm on the Masters in Living Infrastructure. It's an extra challenge. I'm David, I'm a Londoner, and um, I'm in the, UC, uh, the architecture department here at the Transports. I'm Jane, I'm from Sheffield, and I'm doing the MSc in Urban Studies. I'm Brian Garcia, I'm a PhD student that's in planning and studying transport level change. I'm originally from Um, I'm, hello everyone, I'm, I'm, ja I'm Charlene, and I'm doing my PhD, completing PhD uh, in public school planning. And I'm John Ward from the MNC. So, technologically, where are we at, John? Uh, no, not quite there, it's all good. Um, so do we no, stop the presentation I would first? say that as there are two sticks and two computers, I would suggest I, I begin with this one, and whenever you are ready with the film, yeah. which is not at all necessary, uh, we can switch it. Okay, so how do I push it when we do it? This? Yes, okay. So, that is the film. Uh, I understand there is a video being taken, there's no problem uh, with me. Uh, I also would like to make sure that whenever there is something you don't understand or you find holes, you just raise your hand and you, you raise the question. Because that's much more lively than to have to keep silent until the end and then start to ask questions. So, there's, that is uh, the project being 40 years old. The national TV uh, gave three minutes to it uh, to celebrate its 40th year, and thus that's what I use about three minutes uh, different uh, images because the language will probably not be understandable to you. Uh, and that is okay. Because it all started in the old city of Lubin. As you know, in the Middle Ages, uh, Bologna and then a few others started to have universities. And actually, I was giving a lecture today at lunchtime about, with the rector of the University of Brussels, um, about the influence of universities on urban development. And that was exactly the case in the Middle Ages. Uh, so this is an interesting picture because it shows many things. It first shows the Middle Age character of the old city of Louvain. <coughs> B, that city was entirely destroyed in the war 1914. Uh, most mostly destroyed. And so it was rebuilt in 1920 as it was, which made a huge controversy at that time. They say, why the hell do you have to build it the way it was? Well, that was the case. And as you can see, all these houses are easily recognizable as being of the late uh, of the late 1920s or the early 1920s, but still the Middle Age character is totally kept the place, everything. So uh, now 70 years after that reconstruction, more than that, there was an international conference on reconstruction of cities after the wars, and this was a great. Suddenly the city of Louvain was fantastic. I personally liked it very much. I live close to it and I've been studying there. And so this was an excellent move. So at that time, uh, in 1960, just a few years later, uh, the linguistic problems started to become acute in Belgium and uh, the presence of a French-speaking university in a Flemish city, even if it had always been speaking Latin and then French, was considered as a polluting element and uh, it was uh, ethnic cleansing was required. <laughs> and so the French-speaking part of the university was invited to leave. <laughs> In fact, the objective was to kill it, because the University of Ghent had the same uh, misadventure in the 30s, where it was a French-speaking university too, and as, uh, the, the French, Ghent University was made Flemish, and the French-speaking uh, section of the university, the half of the university, was simply suppressed. So that is obviously what they wanted to do in the way, but fortunately, the president of the university, my boss, uh, was a very strong personality. 
and uh, uh, the sea has organized uh, the defense in a way which has proven uh, uh, just by himself. So, in 1962, uh, 63, uh, and uh, the, the reason why I was chosen is because uh, I was the first person who had implemented a law of 1962 in Belgium, which uh, was a planning law which had some resemblance with the 47 Act, but they did not understand and it had been corrupted by three key articles which had been introduced by developers. So it was a law by developers for developers. The famous law of March 1962 in Belgium, which uh, created the planning system in Belgium. So the three articles which were introduced by developers were very interesting. The first one was an article saying that if a developer had half of a block half of a block, he could be entrusted with the expropriation of the rest of the block. And so I wrote in my, among my books on property markets, I analyzed how the price of the plot was steadily climbing until the developer got half and then got down because then he had the expropriation right. So but then it's completely vicious, but that, that's it. Another article was that if a developer was not satisfied with the decision of the administration, he had the right to appeal, but not to another administration, to the provincial government, which is, in other words, he had he could appeal from a state government to a provincial government, which is, of course, the contrary of all uh, legal uh, imagination. And then the third one was, if somebody uh, had a plot uh, for which development was refused, and which normally should have been built, he had the right to compensation. Uh, I have only seen that in one country in Malaysia where they had a similar system. Uh, but as you can imagine, this, 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 that is a kind of biographic beginning of it. So the whole thing was that uh, when the university had to leave, the president of the university said, what the last thing we want is to, to, to be killed in the, uh, in the ambulance, as he said. And the other thing we don't want is to have a campus. And then, uh, because he had seen a few campuses, namely the ones of the Robbins Report in England, etc., and so on, were far from successful. And so he, de he, he decided that if they had to leave a, a, a historic town, he should create a historic town. And that is, that is the whole idea. And then all the rest is execution. Because he was really the person who had the brain to, uh, to say, we want a, a private, you know, of course, private. Why? Because the government was, of course, the, the University Grants Committee was uh, had about the same reaction as if one of the Robbins universities uh, had decided to create a new town. It's not your business. Um, and, of course, the Socialist Minister of Education at the time said the Catholics want to make uh, speculation uh, and so on. So, so it was quite a discussion, uh, but nevertheless, the university uh, went ahead and a board of 1,000 hectares in a place uh, fully in the countryside where nobody would ever believe they would have been something else than uh, uh, farmhouses. And another peripecia, which is interesting to know, is that the president of the university, who is not a planner, had been very impressed by a lecture by Victor Groot, Victor Groot from the Sanctions. So he very imprudently gave him a contract to build a new town. And uh, that was, of course, a great mistake because uh, Victor Brun was very, um, uh, on a few very interesting uh, developments in Fresno, California, and so on. But uh, he was definitely not somebody who had the feeling for European New Town. And so when his mother came uh, to the university, uh, on which I had actually participated because I was in Los Angeles to look, to give to Victor Brun the de details about the programs. And so I, I had seen from the beginning that this was not at all uh, going to, to appeal it. And that's, that's when the uh, model was rejected by the university community, the president of the university said, we need to have people from the house. And then he took uh, <coughs> Professor Le Maire, who is a uh, historian of cities, a great uh, restorer of parts of the city of Louvain, great man, died too early, uh, and I was his student. And I enjoyed very much working with him. So, uh, as, as I had done for three years 
the implementation of the planning law of 1962. Uh, it was quite, I was the one who was going to get it through uh, administratively and economically. And then the third one was a professor of architecture in Moscow. And so that dream of three people was then in charge of the new town. Now let's come to it. Um, this, that is the urban sprawl of Belgium. Thus, as Belgium has always been a place of small communities, <coughs> villages as they say in China, um, and not uh, and a few big cities. But as you can see, the whole place is urbanized. Uh, and uh, Antwerp, Ghent, Brussels, Louvain, uh, and then only the southern part of Brussels was less urbanized. And thus, as we wanted to be as close as possible to Brussels, we decided to buy 1,000 hectares of agricultural land. Uh, <coughs> and, as you can see, that is the 1,000 hectares. Very easy to buy, because the uh, Belgian law is extremely favorable to the tenants and very unfavorable to the landowners. The tenants have the right, the farmers have the right, to have three times 37 years, as in other words, for 81 years, the landowner cannot uh, make what he wants with his property. And so uh, this was all owned by five landowners who were living <coughs> in Paris, most of them. And the mayor of the city, that small city of 3,000 inhabitants, uh, was very happy to have uh, these uh, five landowners sell their land to the university, and uh, that was the one of the first things I was in charge of, was the buying of the land, and uh, very fortunately that could happen very easily, because uh, first of all nobody believed in it, and B, of course we bought it through different agents, so people did know, not know that there was a large buy around, but mainly um, the, the main important things, and it's in China the same as in Belgium, the main thing is when you do a large project is to not only to buy the lands, but to, to buy the rights linked to the ownership of land. In other words, the farming land, the farming contracts, the farming leases. And that was done. All the, all the farms were fortunately in the same union, the union of farmers of the area. And thus the discussion was in fact with the head of the union of farmers. And fortunately, it's much more, it's much easier to have a discussion with one person than with uh, uh, several, maybe 30, 30, 40 different uh, farmers. And that went very well, because we came to a kind of grid of the criteria for the price, and uh, we decided then to have uh, leases transformed into uh, concessions for one year. As in other words, the farmers abandoned, they got an amount of money, they abandoned the lease spontaneously and they said we can stay in the other land as long as you don't need it, but once you need it, we have to leave uh, uh, within one, one uh, period of, uh, it was mainly a week, uh, of, so that we don't lose what we have uh, 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 put on the, how would I call it? Um, is when they start in, in the spring to, to, to uh, sue the wheat, they could keep that and this, in other words, it could never be expropriated again uh, before the, the, the autumn. Is that clear to you? Yes, that, that, I suppose, it is something which happens everywhere. It is very rarely told about, but it's very of key importance, particularly for the new towns in, in England, it has been very important, even in Dutchworth. So that is then the law that what we want. Of course, there was an out, outcry from the government. They said, why do you need 1,000 hectares for a campus? Because they were still sticking that it was a campus. Then, uh, fortunately, there is an example in the University of California called Santa Barbara. The Santa Barbara campus, you know all that because you have been professor there. Um, the Santa Barbara campus is on 800 hectares. It's nearly 1,000 hectares. Because they count one parking space where the student lives, where he is having teaching, where he eats, and where he entertains. That's in other words, they had four parking spaces per student. And thus, although the Santa Barbara campus is not that large, it was able to be spread on 800 hectares. So we 
proudly present to the government the uh, discussion about the, the whole expansion of bus and the power. So you see, we, we really need that. And then the government said, okay, you may, you may have that land, we will give you subsidy uh, university grants committee, but you cannot sell it. So they did not want us to do speculation. You cannot sell it before 2020, and you can only have on that land people who are related to the university. So as we are in Belgium, but here we are not in Belgium, what would you have done when you got such a kind of diktat, Peter? Uh, I think I would have found an, an interesting way of reclassifying people <laughs> so that they belong to the university, perhaps. <laughs> who else? Yes, well, that's, that's of course the second part of the answer. Yes, indeed, that's what we did. We uh, created an association of the friends of the university, and uh, before you could uh, buy the land, uh, not buy it. The first thing is, how could we turn around the idea of not selling the land? But, uh, of course, they, they ignored totally the long-term lease, um, 999 years in, in Britain. So, we just decided not to sell the land, indeed, but to have long-term leases. That in other words, all the land which was put on the market was put on the market for a maximum duration of 99 years. Why do I say a maximum? Here you surely have an answer to Why maximum and not 99 for everybody? Come on. Chinese ingenuity. Well, for a very simple reason. Is that if you do, if you do that, if you have a lease the same duration for every month, what happens at the end of the lease is that they speak with each other. And they become, they, they start to become a lobby to try to have the best terms of termination of the lease. And that is something, of course, that you want to avoid. And so if the leases are ending at different times, that is not possible. And there was a good precedent, is that in Belgium there was already one uh, area which had been developed by long term lease, it was a, a place called the Haan, a very interesting uh, sea community, sea coast community, which had been developed in um, uh, 1880, uh, 1870 something, for 99 years. And what happened at the end of the lease, when people saw that they had only a couple of years left for the lease, they of course started to speak with each other and to uh, share money for a little gift to make sure that the man in charge of notifying fit the end of the lease would forget to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, there's no proof of that. But I'm personally writing for the moment a, 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 a thesis of a student to try to know more about that very murky uh, event in Haan, <coughs> West France. Uh, particularly that uh, next year there will be an anniversary of, of Canberra. You know, Canberra was in Australia was uh, <coughs> uh, on long-term lease. It was also a very interesting history, and it might be interesting to, to see. And the, the, the long-term lease is becoming very important again because it's a way to uh, finance the construction of affordable housing uh, without having to uh, oblige the uh, people acquiring uh, their homes to pay uh, an enormous cost of land. It's not like in Japan where 80% of the cost, total cost is on land, but uh, nevertheless it becomes much more important than what is reasonable. And if you use long-term lease, you can give the land to the user without having to uh, sell it outright. Just that is the piece of land. So we said to the government, look, uh, we, we, are, we promise you we will never touch that wood there that we will only use the middle part, and all the rest will remain agricultural. And so that was finally the agreement, and thus uh, there was this new two things, uh, long-term lease, uh, and um, a, a agreement that was only invested. So this is now, um, another thing is that, as the only equity of the university was the university grants, very little. So the university had to be very thrifty. So to make it thrifty, and that is where we come to the infrastructure business, what is costly in a new town, particularly the ones in Britain after the war, much less in Metzwell because they did it exactly the way we did it gradually, 
in the uh, late 60s, the new towns in Britain were lavishly funded for infrastructure, uh, much more than was needed. And they then sometimes had a surplus of infrastructure which never found uh, a use. This is typically the case of Cumberland. Um, and uh, as we did the country, we started with the existing roads, the same as the one you had there, that road. And we said we, we have to start the whole development from that road, so we don't have to create more roads than it. So we built the first road there, and we had a linear master plan, <coughs> which was to go there and there, and ultimately cross the whole, the whole site. And thus it is a linear master plan based on a pedestrian street. And uh, this, from 1972, the very first phase, if the place had stopped, if for some reason there had been no more finance, the thing would be viable. From the first phase in 1972, the whole thing, it was as viable as the, 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 the campus of Lancaster today. Uh, who has been to Lancaster? Uh, you, know, you know that Lancaster is a linear master plan. And uh, uh, it started from the east, and then it develops uh, along that that line. And that is the idea that we took over. And actually, Gabby Epstein, who was the uh, inventor of Lancaster, was one of the architects of the Canada. And thus, uh, we started from there. And uh, why did we decide to have a pedestrian? Uh, first of all, for, for cost reasons. Much cheaper to have a pedestrian street with uh, possibility of parking uh, along, than to have um, an automobile uh, network. And B, if you look at the space consumption of a street for pedestrians and the space consumption of a road, you see the proportions. If you take as one unit the space consumed by a pedestrian or somebody using public transport, you see that the bicycle is already using about four or five times more space, but you have to leave it somewhere. Thus, there is a, a problem of uh, load of uh, travel and consumption of space when the, uh, when the person, when the mode of transport is not. Uh, is it, uh, should I say something more on the right? Is it better like this? Um, so this if you take a car, the car consumes about 18 times average more space than a pedestrian, but you have to add the space the car is using while it is not driving. That means 90% of the time of its lifetime. And thus you see immediately that if you want to accommodate the whole city <coughs> for the car, you get to an impossible situation because the difference of space consumption is from 1 to 90. Because if everybody is commuting to a central place by car, you have to consume, you have to count that the consumption of space uh, for driving to the place is already 20 times pedestrian, but you have to add the space of uh, parking. Is that clear to you? Because that is something that is very largely ignored by planners because they believe that, well, of course, you know, uh, uh, the car takes a little more space, but difficult to imagine that kind of arithmetic proportion between planning of a, a space when the car is uh, driving and the space it needs when uh, it is not driving. And thus, that is what we did. It's like in Lancaster, a pedestrian street and the cars could come in from each side. And uh, occasionally an underpass, like in Manchester, like in Lancaster. And plus here you had a little road, which started from the existing road, here too. And uh, uh, that is the main pedestrian street uh, for multi-purpose. And that can be applied in China, uh, as well as in Europe or, or, or elsewhere. And that is how the, the street road, of course it was Street. Here are all buildings, university and non-university. That is the, how it looked in 72. And in 76, the station was added. That was a great block that the National Railway Company 
accepted to create a new station uh, uh, not based on any COBA cost benefit analysis because there were no passengers immediately, but they accepted the, the pr perspective of having passengers later on, which actually was very good, very good calculus because as the university and the campus and the, the new town is extremely successful, uh, the station has been uh, very well, very well used. And as you see here, you, you start from the existing road, then you have a first little piazza, pedestrian street continues, continues, another piazza, another piazza, and then you come to the station. Let's, let's see how it looks. That was the center of the first phase, 72. This, uh, the idea was to make it cheap, uh, but to have one iconic building, a kind of church. Uh, and this is the, the science library. Uh, we, they did not buy a, put a church, but we asked to a very uh, prominent architect in Belgium, Jacques Main, to uh, make a building which would be not only a, a science library, but would be an iconic building. And so that became somehow the image of the new town in 72. That means at the very beginning. And here you had a kind of piazza, the gathering place, and the underpass, which I showed you in the diagram, is just under this place. <coughs> and that worked very well. It was a rather mineral place. And uh, next to it, to have more nature, there was a kind of covered plaza uh, with trees. Thus there was a kind of uh, contrast between the mineral, the purely mineral part of the piazza for the uh, science library and a walking place, a kind of garden, just next to it. You should see that in plan, those who are architects, uh, it is very striking. And this shows you exactly how that pedestrian street looks like. Few trees, but planted at strategic places. That's a building by Epstein, just the architect of Lancaster. And the design vocabulary was basically a brick, Belgian material par excellence, and concrete, a mixture of uh, brick and concrete. Probably too much concrete. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, again, coming back to the other diagram, as you see, uh, uh, the parking at the outside of the building uh, is here. But it was a very, very specific thing. Uh, we asked to the uh, architect, uh, in fact, the landscape architect of the parking, to have, and that was in fact his idea, is to plan them, of course, to have uh, no concrete, no asphalt, because the rain could go through. But he had the idea to have all the trees of the parking different. No trees, you see all these trees are different. Why? They're landmarks. You can tell yeah, maybe. What else? There's no need for them not to be. Pick what? There's no need for them not to be different. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but the same. It's a... Uh, no, actually the reason was, and that proved absolutely right, first of all, illness, you know in, in Britain you have a, a new illness of some trees, but mainly because each tree attracts different kinds of birds. Birds hate to go always in the same tree. They want to have a, a, a biodiversity of their menu. And so, uh, and that has now become such a variety of birds that it has been declared a bird reserve. This is rather paradoxical that a parking space has become a bird reserve. The only ones who are not happy are the ones who are sometimes finding some shit in their car. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but then that gives you a little word, a word to the uh, car cleaning. Uh, <laughs> okay, so then in 76, uh, the uh, university uh, got the gift of a new station by the government. That was built, there's the track. First of all, it was, there was a tunnel, and uh, it was a, a kind of cave, kind of artificial valley, which housed the uh, trains, the roads, and all the above space was sold 
to the station, and it became also a building for administration, housing, and everything. So the air rights were immediately used by the university uh, before the trains arrived, because it's cheaper when you have air rights to use them when the trains are not yet there. And now, the next phase uh, is that there is now a shopping center in 2005, which has been created exactly there. And that successful shopping center, 8 million visitors per year, uh, is <coughs> going to cover this. Because the new station is entirely underground in view of being covered at the later stage. That is happening now. Thus, it will be covered. And thus, it will become another part of the public space for pedestrians. So, this, this shows you uh, the, the overall master plan. Thus, it starts from the existing roads. It goes, this the existing road here. Pedestrian 3, pedestrian 3, pedestrian 3, the new station. And then, from the station, as the land was lower than the normal anyway, uh, there has been a slab. The, the rest of the pedestrian new town has been built on a slab, not a high-rise slab like in Exeter, but a low-rise, a gentle slab, uh, where all the underground parking, deliveries and so on could take place. The whole place being more intensely uh, commercial, university and also housing. So this, that is how it looks like. And this, then the lower part of the site was there and uh, as we wanted to make it also as cheap as possible, all the storm water, including the water coming from the parking spaces, was drawn, was guided to an artificial lake which was exactly the lowest point of the site. And thus that artificial lake has been treated as a water reserve, as a reservoir, but at the same time as a place uh, of agreement, of, of agreeable place, which was uh, favorable to the uh, attraction of residential place. Because don't forget, the university had only as equity the, the grants, and thus all the rest of the money had to come from selling the land or selling the leases. So if you had such an artificial lake, uh, that has been a very great boost for selling uh, apartments, uh, high density, low rise to the newcomers. Uh, this, this is how the slab looks. See, this, the outside of the slab you have the forest land which you have shown, and this is land which has been uh, um, sold on long term lease to uh, developers, small developers, usually from the city of Louvain. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it's brand, but it is uh, cozy, uh, low price, and uh, there is a marketplace like in every every village in Belgium. <coughs> and uh, that is how the station looks from the street. Because the whole thing is pedestrian. The street, that is the pedestrian, long term, the, the, the spine of the whole university is there. And you can see that the uh, the entrance of the, of the station on the street is here, and then they have to go down a few steps, and then they will get to the train that you saw in the previous page. That is how it looks like from the tracks, and this is how it looks like from, from the street. It was very bland, but pleasant, and the slab has been an immediate success. So in other words, people have liked to come and live there, having uh, commerce, uh, it was all arcaded canopies in order to protect against the rain and the sun. And uh, this is how it developed. That is all developed between 1976, when the station got into operation, and 1990. Uh, about 20 years to fill that slab, little by little, phase by phase. And this is how it works. There's the lower part of the land is owned by the university. Uh, you have parking space which is uh, used either by the university or leased by the university. You have the uh, uh, train station, more parking, and above you have all pedestrian and you have uh, developers and academics, uh, a, a mixture of university buildings and buildings uh, for uh, private use. And the 
pattern was like in traditional old, uh, old cities in Europe, uh, canopied, but narrow streets, uh, medium rise, three, four stories, and uh, the space inside the blocks was either open to the public if it was a university building or closed and uh, with a garden if it was a private building. It's a great ride. <laughs> and this shows uh, one of the largest buildings. You see here you have pedestrian space, pedestrian streets, pedestrian piazzas, and this is of course uh, almost a scandalous copy of the Bologna. Uh, it's really an Italian uh, university town, but it works. People like it. Uh, the architect Verhagen uh, is a, a, a very, very good architect. He, he actually had a very good experience in that building. It was a few years ago. Uh, the German Academy came and the architecture section, Baukunstabteilung, uh, came to visit the Urbana <coughs> By chance, the architect was there, and uh, the, uh, the German architects asked us, who was your, uh, your contractor? And he said it was uh, Strava. Oh, very interesting, Strava, we, we are using Strava. And then uh, there was still our discussions about all the nitty gritty of the cost of the building. And to their amazement, the building cost exactly half of the price a German building of the same kind would be uh, costing. And then, how is that possible? Well, the architects are very simple. We don't use quantity surveys. Do you know what is quantity surveys? Yes. Because, um, we don't use quantity surveys, but my plans are made like if there was a quantity survey. That means when Straba came in, they said, now uh, let's have the working plan. You don't need working plan. Yeah, all my plans are working plan. Oh. And that is how the Straba was not able to count, to charm the, customer, the client, the huge services which are always the case when you have to change the plans. And so that is why the building was 50% cheaper than uh, Strava buildings in <coughs> other places. Do you understand that uh, tricky business? Who does not understand? Okay. And thus, this is uh, exactly how the slide works. Uh, gardens, uh, small places, all looking rather large, but in fact very small with restaurants and so on. By the way, you uh, may want to buy trees on the slab, it's very easy, because uh, quite already from the 60s, uh, if you put kind of iron bricks, you can have trees with a very low, uh, 50 centimeters <coughs> to one meter of earth is enough to have fully grown trees. And thus in 2005, the shopping center came in and has brought a new dimension because uh, it added very much the choice of shopping for the inhabitants because they could either go to the small shops which were there or uh, use the shopping centre. Moreover, the agreement with the developer of the shopping centre was that he also had to develop a residential street, which he did, which also was uh, uh, very successful. And then uh, the, all the stormwater is collected to an artificial lake that serves as a reservoir and in the So uh, at this point, I would again like to know what kind of question that comes into mind, because this is, uh, we are now about uh, two thirds of the, that is about how the traditional Louvain-Laneur development has been going on. The new development I'm going to speak just after this. Now, are there questions of, about what you have heard until now? Yes. How was the government persuaded to build a railway station without any inhabitants currently? Well, I will tell you. Uh, the Minister of Transport was a French guy. And uh, he uh, was very ashamed at what happened. Because it is clear that the kicking out of the university was very unethical. It was really a move by the nationalist French movements. Uh, which are a bit ideologic, you know, but nationalists are all over the world, including in the UK um, and Scotland. Uh, they, they sometimes have dreams which are not, not really fit to the reality. And that was the case. 
the, the city of Louvain and the Flemish population definitely did not want the university to, to leave or to be killed. And thus the minister was very conscious of that and he said, well, look, uh, it's a kind of gift that we make to you uh, to have this station. It, it's not justified by the COBA, but it is justified by your master plan. So if your master plan is successful, uh, we will make a return on that station. If you fail, but it could not really fail because already there, it was already two or three years in operation. He said, then, then uh, you go ahead. And that's, it's the more interesting that the, the railways do not have the land, they only have the corridor where the, the trains are moving. But your question is, uh, leads me to the next point of my presentation. <coughs> now, I'll just show you that, uh, you know, if you have an amenity at the same time as a reservoir, you must make sure the water is reasonably clean, so that you have to kind of free. So that is the, the, the look as it is now, as the university, and as you see that you still have uh, possibilities of development around the lake. So by contrast, I wanted to show you Cumberland. Because in Cumberland, they did the mistake of building this huge center, as big as one of Louvain, but uh, without making sure that people would use it. So it's a bit of a kind of isolation, and the, uh, they never found really good tenants for that. So little by little it became, have you been, who has been to Cumberland recently? How many years ago? Mm. Ten. And uh, was it already specialized? Yes, it was in the commission. So, but uh, my personal view is that it's completely their fault <coughs> because they have made a plan which was a kind of center in isolation instead of being part of, of, of the spine uh, 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 in our case. So that shows you again how it works. The spine is here, and then you have all sorts of uh, diverticles uh, around the spine on each side. That is a private museum. There's the Tintin, uh, the, 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 uh, the Tintin story that has been a, 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 a milk cow for the publisher and for, uh, <laughs> for, and for the, the, the Mr. Hergé and his wife. And so his wife said, we must make a, a museum for uh, my husband, my, my past husband. And um, they first tried in Brussels but the administration in Brussels is notoriously inefficient, and so they were not able to find an agreement with the Brussels administration in time, and so they decided to come to Nouvelle and Earth. And that is how the museum looks like now. It has already five years, quite successful. And uh, this is part of the spine. So now, the next point I want to bring to you now is the, the development which is going on for the moment. What has happened is that in 2002, the government has decided to make a long-term plan for the development of an ESPA. That's the same thing as the overground in Britain or the uh, air layer in France. And so they said, your station, as the whole area has now developed very much, should be the end point of the line. Thus, and thus, that little stage you have seen there, in the previous slide, would become the center. Of, uh, of one of the nine lines of this uh, regional railway system. So that's a, a tremendous challenge. Because of course, once again, it's the state which pays everything. The state pays the party. The state pays everything. But for us, the university, it's of course a challenge. Because you see, that is the station as, as you have seen. That is the shopping center as you have seen. And that is the huge parking and thus there will be a kind of challenge to know how to use the parking both for commuters and for inhabitants, how to continue the style of identity low rise and so on. That's <coughs> precisely what is in, under discussion for the moment. And the next book I'm preparing is to tell the story of that new development. What is going to happen? What, have, what will be the effects of this huge infrastructure built, of course, not as large as the ones that you have been studying in Boston, but nevertheless, or, or in uh, St. Pancras, 
But nevertheless, it's a large, uh, at regional scale, it's a large, a large development. This is very large center, a large parking, 2,500 places of parking. Uh, how do you have, do you have access to it? And that is that is in fact the, the an ongoing uh, uh, discussion for the moment. And uh, the is extremely uh, controversial. That means that many of the inhabitants feel that they should better do without it. Uh, by the way, as the place is not a, 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 a community, it's only one fourth of the community. In fact, the decision makers from the participation point of view are is the association of inhabitants. Because all the inhabitants are members of that association, which to answer the question of Peter Hall, we created that association from the very beginning because this was the justification of uh, closeness to the university. But that association has then grown and has become uh, quite a quite a uh, powerful partner in all discussions, both the university, landowner, and the municipality of Otini, which is the administration <coughs> in charge of giving the planning permits. Thus, it's a dialogue between community, town, town, and the uh, community of inhabitants. <coughs> so. Um, because that is really the ongoing story. Uh, some people say it's too large. And uh, the developer of the shopping center has made quite recently a uh, press conference saying we have 2,500 places of parking for our new developer. <laughs> He's using the parking for the communities. <coughs> it's clear that parking will be an area of contention because it will be required uh, of course, there's always a compromise. You can open parking for the shopping center only after 10 o'clock, so that they will be sure that the parking of the shopping center will not be used by commuter. But it's, a, it's an interesting uh, discussion. It's a whole new science called parkology. And uh, this, the book I published was in 2009. That means it's already very old. And uh, uh, this, the 19th, uh, in 2013, the new book it will first be a conference and then a book uh, about the new developments of, of new movie. So, uh, how long have I spoken now? About 40 minutes. Well, that's about exactly the time which we had foreseen. And uh, I just wanted to finish on three fetish uh, posters now by Hunter Bassett, uh, an Austrian painter I like very much, and who made three posters for UITP. The one showing the high density, low rise business. The other one, how the transport and linearity is feeding the city. And the third one, and most important one, he did one year before he died, was that uh, the city is a place to enjoy. Cities are functionally no longer needed uh, today because of the telecommunications, but they are always a place where you like to enjoy. And that will be the conclusion of my presentation, uh, waiting for further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to try to get that video going, or should we go straight to questions? You can try it, and we'll be But questions could go on already, if there are. Usually, when there is no first question, we just go straight to the second question. <laughs> well, let me ask the second question then. Um, I suppose, uh, to open it up a bit, I mean, the whole saga of the Bollander um, really raises the question which you, 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 you touched on at the beginning of new universities and also university relocation. So I was thinking that the, the world major relocation, <coughs> for instance, the Amsterdam Free University, um, uh, the whole uh, technical university, um, and, um, uh, and um, indeed some, some universities here in this country, um, some of them were planned in relation to public transport, especially tram extensions. In Yellow, they're putting in a very interesting tram extension right in the middle of the campus now. But the, the, the really interesting question, I suppose, is how are you put together in a, in a strategic plan a new university campus, a new transport line, and then associated development? Um, mm -hmm. uh, 
like that shopping center uh, and, and, and like the park and ride facility because they can too easily come in in conflict with each other. Um, uh, uh, it, and it, it does suggest that you have to somehow begin to plan the university campus in relation to what's happening around it and between it and the city. I, to <coughs> I, 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 I completely agree with you. I, would, I would say that I'm personally not in favor of a campus at all. Uh, the campus of Harvard works very nicely, or the, 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 the grounds in Cambridge and Oxford, but because they are part of this of an urban village, they are not an isolated campus. Isolated campuses are the Robbins uh, New Universities, York and so on, and the French universities. When I visited the French, together with Le Maire, uh, the other guy on the planning, uh, we, of course, it is almost impossible to, to remember the slides we took because they were all looking exactly the same. Um, there's Talence in Bordeaux, Alarmé, all these French campuses are made according to the same kind of, uh, of bureaucratic rules, which were excluding, in fact, uh, the uh, uh, mix of activities which a city needs. And that is the big problem of campuses, is that they are much too even harder. Uh, besides, besides a few cafes, you have uh, the shopping outside, Berkeley. Uh, does that work well in Europe, in Telegraph? Uh, just outside of the campus and then no commerce in the campus itself? I, I think reasonably well. There have been some problems, well there were in my day, with Telegraph going downhill and becoming a rather seedy area that people avoided at night. Um, also, because Berkeley is like Harvard or MIT in the middle of a very large metropolis, um, uh, 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 its relation to the BART system is interesting. And the BART is necessarily peripheral to the campus. I mean, it's quite a hike <laughs> to walk from the BART station all the way up the campus to, say, Worcester Hall, where DCRP is located, as you may know if you've ever done it. So it's not perfect, but I suppose keeping the integrity of the campus uh, was a very important feature in Berkeley. And I think in other campuses <coughs> across the US, they didn't ever contemplate big mixed use development. Almost but Columbia has that. Yes, that's true. It's yeah. an urban Columbia, and uh, of course, Columbia Mortingside Heights had become a very unsafe place at some point. Right. And the latest years of Dunkins. But uh, just after one year of Giuliani, the place became absolutely safe, uh, completely a metamorphosis. And uh, in Britain, what is the story of, of uh, the mixed use? I, 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 yeah, I, I think the criteria by which one makes judgments here is needs to be clarified. And, you know, the concept of success or failure of campus sites. I don't feel I don't share your view necessarily, I think, that some of these campuses. It depends on what you expect from 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 a, a, a new place of learning. So um, I think there's probably probably a broad feeling that some people feel that campuses work and others don't. It depends on what one's expectations are. Um, I don't know what you think you're more expert than Well that. I mean I, I twist it round a bit and to say that some of the most problematic places I think were were those in which you put a campus, uh, a pure academic campus, and, and almost effectively nothing else. Uh, Reading was and is, I think, a notorious case, where the campus is very pleasant, set in a park, but all you've got is a row of shops uh, at the edge of the campus, including one cafe, and all the real life of the university is in the center. Um, and, and that doesn't work well, at least it didn't in my day, uh, in uh, in uh, some Dutch universities, I suppose Utrecht would be a, an interesting case, they rather deliberately didn't put much on the new campus uh, so that all the students flood back into the centre of the old city uh, uh, at night and then rush off to take the last train home because everyone lives everywhere in the Middle East. But then the question may be raised, why not put the whole thing in the centre? Yeah. Because then you have all the dangers of vandalism of an abandoned place, 
I know that there's a defect because there was a Congress of the Planners in the Educatorium as part of that new development. And there we had the very great privilege to enjoy seeing how Rem Kohlhaas was doing about everything wrong uh, in that campus. There was a, a big staircase which came to a ceiling and then you had to go back down to the right. Um, so anyway, just that, that is the reason, but maybe I would much prefer to have uh, uh, now some of you uh, discussing your, your um, I just have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, what is the most important reason for for evaluating this one as a successful case? Because it reminds me of using the, the university as a strategy to develop or to, to make a, a place, a poor place, or a um, vulnerable place as a, a strategy for their non revival. And uh, I'm thinking if there's another place in other part of country, the other country, like in China or in Taiwan, they usually want to have a university. And uh, they think university will bring people, students, to consume locally. And that is one of the strategy for them to, you know, to revive or to have another possibility. So I think probably here you have a more deeper relationship with the tradition of kind of some kind of reason you have already a lot of people have skill or any kind of inherited uh, character. So probably this is successful, but this is not, this, this could not be transformed to other contexts as using a university as a, a simple strategy to develop. Because I think it's a very problematic for, for, for other countries. The second one is... Um, but maybe we could first... Uh, Richard, the first question is okay. very, very important. Just the question is, uh, what are the criteria of success of the universities as a tool for urban development? That is your question. So here you have, of course, to know your market. In this case, the market was there. The universities, <coughs> students, and professors wanted a place to go. Just that place could either be Brussels which was my initial idea, because uh, there was place enough to do it in Brussels, and that would have been better for everyone. And then there was the other uh, idea was to make it in an existing small town, Wawel, which refused it because it was a socialist town, and they said Catholics will bring uh, me down, which appears to be completely wrong because he lost his majority anyway. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so this if you had to move a, a thing which basically is a, a body of, uh, uh, of learned forces which is already existing, that is the kind of question. Do you put it in a city? Do you put it in the suburbs? Do you put it in a new campus? Or do you create a new one? And that is what we have tried for the best of the worst to do in our case. Now, if you want to bring a university as a tool for development of a city, but there you come to the German case. The German case, because there are 19 university cities in Germany, they are sticking together very closely. There is an association of the university towns. And when you enter the city of Marburg, you see a big panel, Marburg, University City of Germany. And thus, uh, there is a kind of collective sense that a university, an existing one or a new one, uh, are an an asset for the development of a city and a kind of prestige item. When you are a university town, it's different than if you're just a town. And that is, is that answering your question? Is just to use the uh, intellectual assets of a university or of existing small <coughs> universities. Uh, in Brussels, for example, there are 70 universities. Uh, and thus, uh, when I discussed uh, with the president of the University of actually I was discussing with him at lunchtime with the, the, the rector of the University of Russell, and that was the kind of things we discussed. He said the 70 institutions of higher education in Brussels are invisible. The only, the only thing that people see is the uh, University of Brussels and the uh, University of Louvain uh, Brussels campus. 
he said, we should really stick together and bring that together and to the attention of the urban decision makers, to the outside world, say that we are a university city and not just the uh, capital of uh, European institutions. That we are something different from just the most uh, visible part of, of what we are. And thus, the, the, what you need to answer your question is to have a strategy of the city and the means to have it successful. Because uh, I speak, uh, who knows Pepperdine in Texas? Uh, that is a, a, a small university who wanted to also create a new town, uh, but it was all very speculative. Uh, they created a law faculty because law faculties are uh, the most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, successful in terms of money. Um, when you have a million lawyers in a country, you have a big market for law faculties. Uh, and uh, but the whole thing is very, very weak. Uh, Fresno, uh, with Victor Brun, had made a, a really successful uh, pedestrian mall in the existing city. But the trouble is that uh, uh, the city of Fresno was too weak to uh, prevent a large shopping center to get just outside of the city, and which killed completely the scheme of it. You really need to, to have a, a, here we come again to the fact that transportation, uh, land use, development, and environment, because in our case, we have been from the beginning extremely environmentally oriented. Nobody spoke about an eco, an eco city, but Nouvelle Alert is really, really a real eco city of the 1969. Yeah. So, this, the, your question raises many points, but I'm not sure that I can answer it without knowing the facts of the case. I think what I want to compare is what do you think uh, underlying this kind of case because in Asia or from Taiwan I feel like the reason why they want to develop a, a university in a place is because of the property uh, property development because they want to uh, make it to develop a town and from very low rent and then to, to care yes. and create that's why I want to yes. do that. Well, um, I like very much Taipei, but I'm not sure that there's that two universities, the National University, which has a beautiful campus, uh, which is very much, very traditional, like uh, the campuses of the 19th century. And then you have the other university, the Technical University, which has moved deliberately from the center to a completely new place, which is very far away. And uh, maybe that's the university you are from. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm from the south. But what? I'm from the south. Yes. Uh, cow shield and the different. But uh, the case of <laughs> uh, in the case of Taipei, I can only say, because I'm uh, giving regular lectures there, uh, it's to me a nightmare. Because the National University is a beautiful campus uh, in the middle of the town, while the other one uh, was taking a pretext that they did not have space enough to expand, to move the whole thing to a very far away place, hoping, as you say, uh, to have an increase of the value of the land, but the trouble for them is that nothing is followed. That's, that campus is now completely isolated. Uh, uh, the students uh, and the professors have to come, as, as in uh, Utrecht, from the city, but very far away. Just, I, I, I see very well your point, and I would never recommend that. I think the, if I had been advising that university, I would have said, just try to buy land next door and to develop on, on what you have, uh, even if you're a little more, a little less bit. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to draw on your expertise with relation to what UCL are planning to do. I don't know if you're aware, but UCL are intending to build the, the same size campuses in Bloomsbury to replicate it in uh, Newham, in East London. Where? In Newham, right by yes. the, the Olympic Village. Yes. Um, and the plans intend to demolish an existing um, housing estate, a 60s housing estate, which is occupied by about 300 families. Um, and it's contentious in a number of ways, and it seems like the successes of Louvain is that threefold, that there was a necessity to build there in the first place, um, that it was, uh, it had the consent of the landowners, or uh, the, the tenants of the land when it moved, and thirdly, that it was sort of incremental and it tested and, and it built slowly. 
Um, and UCL's plan seems to have none of these three. Um, it's building over an occupied land where the, land, the residents are unhappy that it's doing so. The actual logic of the plan is questionable. Um, why UCL needs to double in size to sort of expand its research capabilities. Um, and then in the uh, very early drafts of plans we've seen, um, it seems like it will be built on sort of tabula rasa, um, oh. uh, completely from a new, not, not taking in the sort of yeah. historical. Um, so I was wondering the sort of, I think the key is relationship with the community that it's moving into, whether you have any sort of where you can draw upon your well of experience on whether other universities have done this and whether that's been successful um, and whether we should go ahead at all. Well, I don't know what Peter Hall thinks about it, but <laughs> I would rather be skeptical because uh, if the place had been completely new, for example, a March land that you want to occupy for something else or a disused airport, uh, as you could do in Athens, for example. It could have been a beautiful new, new area and university on the former Athens uh, airport, which is empty now for uh, 15 years, uh, or 15 years. So, so the, the question is, uh, if the University of London, uh, when I look here, I see there are many places which can still be built up. There is one in Golden Street where you can make new things, you have high density possibilities, uh, the city has multiplied its plot ratio. There's no reason why the University of uh, London could not do the same thing. Uh, if they allow it for a, a, an office building, which will probably be empty very soon because of the crisis, uh, uh, why could you not do it? Uh, and actually I have proposed such thing for the University of Brussels uh, in, in Brussels when they were abandoning the uh, administrative city, as they call it, administrative city, uh, which had been built at the expense of a residential area. But when it became empty, why not use it for the university? Uh, there was, because there was no demand for offices. So I'm a bit skeptical at the uh, cost-benefit analysis of demolishing an existing residential area, unless there are political reasons. Is the kind of people living there the kind of people the government doesn't like? Um, well, there's certainly the, the, the local um, council, Newham, have certainly seen this as a, a, an opportunity to, to bring in more revenue. But there's also a, a, a claim from UCL scholars that UCL is seeking to just d uh, double its property assets so it can borrow against it rather than... Yes, I see it. What is, uh, uh, maybe that's an interesting question, Peter Hall, did you, did you follow that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yes, we've all been trying to follow it, and there, uh, there is a suspicion that, yes, this is the um, uh, motive uh, of the uh, UCL um, uh, property people who seem to be uh, uh, a bureaucracy operating totally on their own. That's in relation. That's in most the universities in and so they want to make a, a, a monument to themselves. Yes, and they, they, are engaged, <laughs> they are engaged apparently in massive property speculation, which is, uh, uh, raises questions of uh, what is the function of the university. Can we? I think uh, the answer comes from somebody who is more authorized than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Next yes. question. Um, it's, it's a really interesting presentation, so firstly, thank you. Um, secondly, I mean, what really struck me was that the approach that was used um, uh, at Nuvan was very pragmatic, very cost-effective, and it's produced a really good outcome. So why isn't it used more widely elsewhere? Then we have to look at the parallelogram of forces. Okay. Which were the forces which were at work in this case? There were, in fact, two options either to go to the centre of the Brand and Brussels, where a very active mayor had reserved uh, uh, 40 hectares, more than enough for a campus, uh, even for urban, urban functions. And then you have the uh, board of the university, which was so traumatised by the fact that they were kicked off uh, a city where they had been living for 500 years. 
there was a tremendous collective will to create something which would create a new image. And that is why they refused the offer to go to Brussels, although this, this would have been an excellent solution, because they would have all the infrastructure was there. They only would have to take care of the university building, they could still have done the campus. Uh, and, uh, but they wanted to have something which was their own image. And the speculation was not at all the motive. The idea was to create a university where the equity coming from the Grants Committee, the budget equivalent of the Grants Committee, uh, could be used to develop something which would be a mix instead of a campus. Mm -hmm. to the case of Rouvain La Neuve was answering to a specific parallelogram of forces. So if you have the same thing elsewhere, you can replicate it. But mm -hmm. you need to have the champion of something. I very much believe that uh, property development requires a, one or a few people who have a collective vision on what they want to achieve. And that is not necessarily making money. Uh, to take an example which has not been mentioned, Jim Rouse. I have a great admiration for uh, the American developer Jim Rouse. Jim Rouse is a very rich developer, uh, but he created a new town, two new towns in fact, uh, just uh, he truly did not become richer because of that, because Fanny Hall and all this makes a lot more money. But he did it. So there you have one developer who has some kind of a social aim at the same time as making money, probably less than Heinz, uh, but still he was by making a lot of money and he decided to do things which were communities. Uh, he restored, and do you know, do you know Fanny Hall? It's a both area in Boston, which has beautifully restored, is now keeping its value already for 50 years. Uh, is that 50 years? Maybe a little less. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then he started to invest in abandoned hotels in New York. Also, nobody asked him to do that. He did it because he said, these buildings are empty, why don't, why don't I use it for uh, affordable housing? So all this is related to the specific profile of one person or a group of persons. Uh, and this, the answer to your question is, how do you replicate something that exists? You cannot. Unless you have someone who has understood that in what he has seen there, there is something that can fulfill his own ambition. Is that an answer to your question? Yes, but it's, yeah, it's a, the point about the vision really the UCL, is I, I see this interest and uh, some sadness that it's the same thing. Uh, we had a meeting in London uh, a few, not long ago, in December, uh, which was hosted by the land registry. And uh, they were in a beautiful building in the centre of London. They sold it because of their real estate people and they bought something in Croydon. Yeah. They lost half of their staff. Uh, why the hell did they abandon a, a good location, known by everyone, uh, 150th anniversary, to go to a place where they are completely outside of the real uh, movement of London, uh, and their all the staff, except the ones who were in that area, uh, uh, just decided to leave it. So, does, in other words, do you agree with me, uh, Peter? Yeah, absolutely. Does, okay. you, does, I think there is a problem with property, is that property is so important that you should not leave it to the property specialists. <laughs> <laughs> they require you on that. <laughs> Pierre, if I may have the last question, we're running okay, out, yes, of time, yes. out of time. Um, you, you made a comment that your presentation didn't refer to a project that was a mega project of the kind of XYZ, but um, <coughs> if uh, and one of our conclusions from the Omega Center is that mega projects actually are often organic, that they may not even start off as mega projects, that they become over over time a, 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 an organic project. Now, so that's one phenomenon, and there's very clearly an organic uh, characteristic there. Another but there is an idea in you, because when you have a linear, that is more than organic. Organic means it grows whenever it likes, like a cancer. 
but if you have a linear mass then you have a very strong direction of it. But you, you also you have organic attachments to it. Okay. So, so divertical uh, Well, okay. Uh, so that's one point, is it? That clearly that there's it's an evolutionary process. Um, the second it is what actually is a is a mega project, that's what we're concerned with, at least some of us around this table. Um, and in some instances, some of these projects seem to be totally driven by the, the market imperatives, the, the market-led. In other instances, one of our students from last year's program was looking at the Women's University in Saudi Arabia campus. And in that became an agent for change, because it was essentially not just a campus, it was achieving to do... so. My first question there is, uh, what, is there a linkage of it? Was it an agent of change in initiative behind this? What I heard from you from said is less so. It's more to do with responding to situations. Uh, the Robins were agent of change <coughs> investments. I mean, they basically, there the, the was in the 60s this uh, intention to invest in, in, in the manpower and that was the driver, but that's not always the case. Uh, but finally, is the question, um, what is infrastructure? I mean, it is, is actually the university infrastructure, education infrastructure, it, does it house knowledge building? Uh, because when we talk about infrastructure, too often we think about roads, we think about, of course, the housing sector often talks about housing as infrastructure, but it does, you know, it does ask the question is, was this an infrastructure project that was designed for the agent to change function? Or was it, as I understand, maybe we're wrong, that there's a lot of, um, they were utilizing the real estate market parameters to, to develop something that evolved? Yes, yes. Uh, your question is extremely interesting. First of all, about the evolutionary aspects. Who among you has read Alexander? Uh, maybe those who have not read their answer do it. Because uh, really, Alexander is to me, I don't know if you agree with me, uh, is really the person who has embodied the gener generative kind of planning. And in a beautiful language, it's not so easy to find because he's not really on the top of his fame for the moment. But all the people who I recommended, he said, yes, you do, you're right. Uh, Alexander is really the person to <coughs> That is about the generative way of doing it. Now, about uh, the need of having a huge project. So here, uh, I would say in the case of Louvain, uh, as somebody said, it's really pragmatic. Because uh, while we were doing this, we realized that, in fact, that area had much better use than agriculture. And so we started to develop a science park, which was not in the same style as the new university, very culturistic, very traditional small, but typically an industrial park like you have everywhere, but linked to the university. And there, there was definitely no shops because people, we wanted people uh, having their uh, laboratories there to use the restaurants and the facilities of the university. And that has been a huge success. Uh, several of the companies of that science park are now uh, in the, the international stock market. Uh, for example, there is one called I, uh, uh, Ion Beam Application, which is probably the largest medical firm using uh, cyclotron applications, which was based on the cyclotron of the university. So, so in fact, Louvain and Earth has been a factor of change. Uh, but it was not planned like that in the beginning. But it, was, it has been the result, and today everybody would agree uh, that it, it has been a, a, a creative element in the landscape of a country where everything is a bit spontaneous. Did that answer your question? Right. Yes. Oh, and more. Uh, and more. Yes. Thank okay. you. Now, the big is where you're coming to Brussels to, to visit uh, another area, which is the, the South Station. There you have a real mega project. That, that will be a different kind of thing, with different kind of criteria. <coughs> okay, we're going to have to call it close now. We've started late, and it's uh, 
some people got some way to go, but I want to thank you for you've come a long way to actually put this presentation. Uh, we're very grateful. Thank you very much.